We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. So welcome. Um, I think we're just going to start. This is this is what it is. And if there's an error, then there's an error. Um, welcome to this uh, session of the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Standards and Security and Safety. And um, Rob was going to was give an introduction to the to the to the Dynamic Coalition, and on this workshop called "Closing the Gap Between the Theory of and the Practice of Security." And there's a reason for the title of this uh, of this workshop because we th we are working on the dynamic coalitions for a year. We started at the the, the virtual IGF last year, and um, we found out that there's this huge gap about talking about the security of the internet and the actual daily practice, which is still mostly insecure. And it's a little little bit black and white. I understand that, but that makes it a little bit easier to, to, to discuss what we're discussing. Um, we're going to do a few things today. The first is the opening. The second were breakout groups, but perhaps we will split in two with one uh, online and one here in the room. And the third item is the reporting back on what, we, what we've heard and then discuss and finally some closing remarks. There are two other sessions with uh, the with the, from the dynamic coalition this week and the first one is on Thursday the 9th at 16:15 in room 4 that will be our second uh, general meeting and one on Friday we have a networking session during the lunch at at 12:30 the dynamic coalition has some very clear objectives and it starts with our slogan that's make the internet more secure and safer and how will we Try to achieve that is by the wider and more effective and rapid deployment of already existing security related internet standards and, IG, and, uh, and in the ICT best practices. And that distinction is there because you got official internet standards and you've got some others that are called best practices, like, for example, the OWASP top 10 that uh, more or less could regulate the, 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 the standards of websites. But what we also try to do is that we are looking at prevention and not at mitigation. Most initiatives that I've been participating in the past were all on mitigation. There's an incident and then we try to fix it. For example, there's a botnet infection. We take the bot, the bot infection down, but we don't go in search of the origin of these infections. And that is what the Dynamic Coalition is trying to do to, to get up the prevention to a higher level so that a lot of the mitigation perhaps may not be necessary. We want to do that by through existing internet standards and already existing frameworks of cooperation. So if we look at the standards, just to give you an idea that we're discussing DNSSEC, so the security of the domain name system. We talk about the RPKI, the routing system, the BCP38 that prevent spoofing. The OWASP already mentioned, looking at the web security of website, but also, for example, secure software principles that exist that make sure that software is more security developed in the first place. And if we do that, we are able to close the gap between theory and practice. So where did this all start, this dynamic coalition, and where do we want to go to? We started with a report in 2020. 2020, and from there, the Dynamic Coalition started. The questions we have to look at is why these internet standards and best practices are not widely and effectively deployed. Some are around for over 20 years, and still they're not effectively or widely deployed. Some better than others, but why not massively in the, in the sense of that everybody simply does it because they're there? Well, some of the answers is that the deployment of standards is usually voluntary. So you have a choice to do or not to do it. But if there's no business case, which is often the case, it's just extra cost, and there's no demand 
from the consumer or the user side, there will be no supply. There's also no level no, playing field. So somebody who actually does it has more cost than somebody who does not deploy. And that is a negative to, for, towards your, your uh, shareholders. So Bout, they're very- sorry, Bout. Yes? Sorry, yes, sorry, Bout, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, tell me Mark. People trying to join this uh, Zoom link. Yes. Uh, I've got in using Yuri's personal link. Um, so what we need is a general Zoom link that I can send to Olaf and all the others who are asking for it. Okay, you, I, is there I somebody see Sa in the support who can provide it? I see Savio waving. So Savio. Okay, but the, it has to be for for everyone. Can there is a Zoom link through which people can access this meeting? Can we? Can I'm looking to the organization now. Sorry, can we get that online somewhere so that everybody who is trying to access this can see it? It, Savio, can you show the Zoom link to the people there? I see it in, uh, Savio put it in the chat. Okay, let's try it. But if, I'll, if send it I'll send it to Olaf in the group. Yes, okay. Okay, okay <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> so slowly, but for this the people is... who, who really do not have access, they can't see the chat as well, of course. Will we... Right, okay. Let me go back on an uh, email to... to so, sorry, the, the organization say something, yes? No. And that is not excellent, <laughs> not, ex not working. Okay, but the, the people who need it, who they are getting it now, right? So uh, Mark, I'm taking it that you're sending it to Olaf uh, because I sent you all an email just now. That link, that link uh, that Savio has provided, that, that yes. works, does it? Okay. I hope so. That's, that's Yuri's link, I think. Well, I'm Yuri. I'm using Yuri's link. <laughs> okay. So the, I'm Yuri. For, at if the you can get I don't that know what to, happened to Yuri. I've no idea. But, okay. Um, if, okay. If you can get that to Olaf and Alif and the others who are external, then okay. we should all be here. And we're I'm getting some more now, people yeah. in the room as well. So we're slowly getting there. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so where where I was with with the, that there are few active drivers for change where, where the deployment of internet standards are concerned because there's no real drive behind it. So what are solutions? Well, we, when we interviewed a lot of people and did a, they did, a, they did a survey late in 2019, many people said, if you started regulating this with new legislation, then perhaps it would come to 100%. But everybody also said, this is a very bad idea because most likely, most governments will make their own regulations that it may break the internet, so never go into that route. But it's important to conclude that this should not be identical to no action at all, because then probably at some point there will be legislation and we have a, a, a time slot to do voluntary solutions. So it should be a voluntary stakeholder-led solution that will bring us forward. But how do we create that business case? The first is that we have to drive demand because when governments and large organizations procure or purchase ICT products, whatever they are or services or devices, if they demand a level of security, that would mean that a business case is automatically created. At the same time, there could be some sort of societal or peer pressure. So for example, from consumer protection agencies or consumer advocacies through relentless testing. The bad side, the dark side is testing our internet and everything 24 hours a day. Why aren't we on the good side? So that could be a system that could actually work to create more pressure. The same could be by aligning politicians and, 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 and the media or existing, perhaps even existing regulatory measures that are there on consumer protection or, or, or on, on liability or technical, technical solutions that are already being monitored, but that look at in a different way. And finally, there should be a better aligned tertiary ICT education. So I'm not talking about cybersecurity education, but everything around ICT. If our students do not leave their tertiary education with 
the measures of knowledge that are needed for this society and how can they ever make sure that it becomes more secure. The current initiatives at the activities at the DCISS are three working groups. The first one is on security by design, the Internet of Things, which that there could be other working groups under that title, but this one is Internet of Things. We're looking at education and skills, and we're looking at the procurement and the supply chain management and the creation of a business case. There is a fourth one on communication because we are professionalizing our organization and there will be a website pretty soon, a domain name, email system, social media handles, etc., which is being funded by an African organization from, from Ghana. There's also a lot of work on outreach. Mark Carvel, who's the senior uh, policy advisor we just, you just saw, and I'm working relentlessly on getting more people aware of the initiative and reaching out and creating the network and, and, and making sure that the financial part of it is sound. One moment. So we're going to try to do some breakout groups and everybody who is online can join a breakout group. And we have five ideas behind it, but let's see if we have enough people, but I think we do looking at it, everything now. The first breakout group will focus on how to identify and promote a list of internet standards that urgently need deploying. It is led by Mark Carvel and reported on by Naveen Lakshman, who are both online. They will discuss with you about 30 minutes on, on this topic. The second topic will be how to get from a limited and slow deployment to a widespread and rapid deployment. This topic is led by Olaf Kolkman and who is online and Robert Tour is Auke Pals, who is sitting in the room here, but will have to be online as well to participate. The third one is how to close the gap between industry needs and tertiary education curricula. There we have moderator Rolof Meyer who's in the room here, but I have one cancellation. So I'm looking at a volunteer here in the room who could do the reporting, uh, Martin perhaps. You, you can't get online, then, then you can do it. You, you can do it here. Uh, the, four, the fourth group is closing the gap between the theory of security and the daily low security. The moderator is Louis van der Laan and the rapporteur is Roos Kist, who I hope is online. And the fifth is the role of internet standards and enhancing human rights and digital inclusion. And that is led by Elif Kizo Cortez and rapporteur is Savio Moraes. And I hope that we're all online, but I see Elif, I see Olaf. So I think we're basically there. Um, I'm going to ask the organization to split everybody up in, uh, in uh, breakout rooms and with the assigned teams. And the people who are not online, I suggest that we have one working group here that we sit together in one spot and one who are online, you can join a working group there. So it's the what everybody prefers. So I'm going to ask to do the breakout to start them and we'll end that at about a quarter past 10. So you have about half an hour to discuss these topics. And from there, uh, the, there will be some reporting and then we have some discussion and wrap up. So thank you very much. So the people in the room who want to join, we're going to make a circle here that it's safe enough and then discuss it and then others are online and you can go to the preferred discussion. Kevin Roos niet. Ja, dat is Roos, ja. Roos is er.
I'm going to try and get in again. Why would I try? Okay, it's Mark speaking. I'm not Yuri. Apologies to Yuri. Somehow I've um, assumed your identity for this. <laughs> I, I don't know. I didn't dare try to go out and come back in in case I got completely lost. But um, I'm uh, I'm moderating the first team uh, with the help of Naveen, who I don't see now. Um, I don't know if we, I don't know if we're being split up yet. I don't know if that's possible even <laughs> with this Zoom Zoom link um, because we're not through. We're not in the uh, on the website, um, so I've no idea if this is working or not. To be honest, um, And I've lost my uh, rapporteur. Um, I don't know if Vout can hear me. Vout, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. I'm not sure what we're doing in terms of well, like, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, my team for the breakout on, I'm, uh, on I'm, standard. I'm checking, I'm checking uh, Mark. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It may not be possible because we're just relying on the Zoom link. Um, But it was, because they've all accessed it, it on a Zoom link of one person in the Ukraine. If that is, if, if, perhaps it's the issue that they can't split up because of it. I don't know. Okay. Yuri, you want to say something? Yes. yes. Go ahead. I am ready. I am <laughs> ready to start. <laughs> I think we're all ready. Okay. We're just waiting for the technology to catch up. <laughs> I, understand, I understand that the rooms are there. Yes, the rooms are there. And, um, you rooms are there. Rooms and the main people who are yes, this, and this is Mar Mark Carvel. He needs to uh, be there. But he is not actually... Uh, on yeah, he's on, the, he's on the Zoom link of Yuri. Of Yuri. Every, most people are on the Zoom link of Yuri Kargopolov. Okay, we, I have no idea. See? Okay, so I'm supposed to... Like connect Yuri to what? To, to Naveen. To Naveen. Yeah. To, to room number one. Okay. Yeah. And any, do you know how, uh, what to do with any of these people? Should I assign them to any of the rooms? You can assign. Yuri goes into one okay. and the rest can be assigned to one of the rooms. Okay. So there's a not people who are here. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, Mark, the, you're going to be connected because you're on the Yuri's name and that you were not here on the. Uh, Right. The, the, so it's being done now. Okay. And then everybody should have his his or her own. Right. I just got a screen message. Okay. I'm going now to uh, Pokoj One. Um. So, good question. There, there's a whole line waiting to be assigned. They're not being assigned to the room. And they're not getting up. Okay. Hello, I'm going to go to the room. Yeah, begin. So, okay. Are are people in the breakout rooms? So, 
everybody is connected online is in the breakout room at this point, I understand. Okay. And that's your rapporteur. He's there. <laughs> So what, so what shall we do? Because the, it doesn't seem to be working. Yeah. That's. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the best thing to do. Okay, it does not seem to be working with, with breakouts. We create one breakout team, which all people external. We're going to create, I think, two here in the room. Is there? There's too many people that are too close. So we do two here and one one external. Mark, can, can Mark hear me? Just to, to, to take everybody out, and then we create one external room. Dan moeten, ja, en dan moeten we wel even het uh, onderwerp uh, determineren wat we gaan doen natuurlijk. Is every, everybody, everybody, yes, everybody is back in. Um, there seem to be some issue with the breakout rooms. So what we've decided is that all the people who are external they're going to be in one breakout room. And I suggest that that's being led by, by Mark Carvel. And uh, Mark, you can choose the topic of your choice, but we will have to make our choice here. Um, my suggestion is to drop the fifth, fifth question and that we focus on this, the externally on closing the gap between the theory of security and uh, daily low security together with in searching for some solutions. And that internally we'll be looking at the, the, some of the perhaps education points and then look at the, the, the potential list of a top 20. That uh, I call it the top 20, but it's the most important identified uh, security uh, standards that we should be focusing on in the first year. So my suggestion is to do that. They will decide here who leads it. We we'll create two groups, this half and this half. Uh, Luzvi, you can do one, and Gulov, you can do the other on that side. And then uh, we'll start working here. Yes? Good. Split it through. Two, there are enough people. Take one. All right. We'll do one here. So I put the uh, I put it down. And I'll see you all half hour from now. And sorry about. I see Mark. You have a hand up. So one question fast. Yeah, um, um, uh, Yuri, Naveen, and me. Not Yuri. Not the Yuri. We just rejoined from our breakout room. Can you recap what you're doing? We, I didn't quite catch it. Um, okay, we're we're splitting it up in two because the breakout rooms were not really working. Understand so that we have all the people online may do one group. And uh, you can choose your topic yourself, Mark. So I suggest that you lead it with, with perhaps with Olaf together, and that Rose will do the 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 the, the reporting, and that here we do Olaf, uh, Rulof, sorry, Rulof and and Luzuis, and then uh, with uh, with Martin and uh, and Auker reporting. So that's uh, the the way we suggest it. So they have two breakouts, uh, two breakout okay. groups, one on site and one there, online. Okay. Yes? All right. Okay. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> yes. Mark, you take it away. I think we have to keep our distance. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, everybody, for uh, persevering through um, technological adversity. It seems it's. Uh, uh, I think this is. Was, is always a risk at the start of a big conference um, that there are going to be glitches.
Okay. Uh, who will be moderator of our room? Uh, that will be Mark, but he is still yes. in the other room. So uh, I <laughs> think he's going to be. Room. Yeah. So he probably has been put in this room, um, and then we can start hopefully. I still don't see him. Okay, is everybody here? I hope so. Well, if somebody says no, that's going to be a weird answer. But uh, anyway, I hope everybody <laughs> has has migrated successfully into our uh, room. So um, now we 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 had to decide uh, of that set of five questions which one to to focus on. Um, now I was kind of prepared um, for the first question about identifying the sort of the key internet standards, which for whatever reason. Uh, my feeling is that if something doesn't get political support or traction, the best way to do it is to find something that is in the political arena and attach it to it. And I think in this case, we see a lot of uh, threats to uh, our way of life, whether it's cybersecurity uh, threats, whether it's um, uh, mingling in democratic processes, um, human rights abuses online, and there's a lot of legislation, especially coming out of Brussels, to try to deal with that. So if we can say that adopting these standards is part of the solution, I think that is something that could actually contribute. Um, the other um, idea that is out there is uh, how to get the consumer organizations on board. I'm chair uh, of the Dutch Consumer Organization, uh, and I think this is an interesting one in your countries, whether we think that something like that uh, could also be led by civil society as opposed to being led by governments. So there's just some thoughts I want to put out there, but this is your session. There's a microphone over there. So it'd be great if people could just uh, get up and, um, and bring in suggestions. Otherwise, I'm going to put people on the spot. <laughs> I'm sure you've thought about this quite extensively. Do you have something to contribute? Would you mind grabbing the microphone? Because we need that for the transcript. It's behind you. My name is Rolf Meyer, for the record. Um, I'm from the same country as Luis, so we should be careful not to <laughs> over-dutch this uh, session. Um, well, maybe maybe on your, your first point, attaching it to um, political theme, theme, uh, themes, um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if that would be the pre preferred option. I think it's better to use uh, the government as a launching customer of, of security standards. Um, I think we're pretty successful in that area in the Netherlands. And I think I, think I would, it's probably a combination of the two, but before starting to, to regulate, eh, so, so using, using political themes to put pressure on everybody, I think it it would be better if, if the government is a showing example. And um, like we do in our country, that if the government signs contracts, um, an IT contract with a private supplier, they have to enforce certain standards in that, in that area. And I think I, I would prefer that kind of an approach. But then we're kind of dependent on that the government actually understands and wants yeah, well, to but yeah, but I mean, we are very dependent on the government to understand in any yeah. area. So yeah, sure. And I think that we can help, and especially the technical sector can help to educate the government. Um, so that, that will be step one um, and, and help the government. Uh, yeah, so you need a kind of an, a standardization organization and uh, get the right um, groups in there and make sure that they influence the government um, and get it on the political agenda. Um, and I think there you're right. Eh? So if there, if there are dangers that these standards will solve, then it will probably help to get them high on the agenda. But I, I, I think that the approach that we have where the government is a launching customer, or at least we try to, to, to make the government launching customer, I think that's a, that's a pretty good approach. Great. Anybody else? Is there anybody here from representing go a government? 
<laughs> Alicia, you want to tell us how uh, how that works? <laughs> no, I just I'm just teasing you. Vim, you've been in this game a little bit longer than uh, than most. Well, I think we might need you behind the microphone for the transcript. So uh, my, my name is Wim Rollens. I'm working for the uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs and uh, Climate Policy in the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I think I, I, I understand very well where uh, Rolof is coming from uh, when he uh, says that the government has an important role to play. And I agree with him that uh, the government has an important role to play um, uh, as a launching customer, but not only as a logic cost, but also as a regulator or stimulator or uh, uh, promoting uh, all kinds of uh, uh, standards, uh, especially also open standards. So uh, we have a, a big program on, on, on doing this, uh, probably not enough. Uh, we, uh, we need to do more uh, about it, but uh, um, I think we have, um, good practice uh, uh, that uh, government services, government institutions, they uh, need to explain or apply uh, certain standards. So if they security standards, but also a standard like IP version six, in a way you can define it also as a security standard. Um, I think uh, there we, we say uh, uh, when you are procuring uh, then you uh, need to uh, ask uh, suppliers to provide this standard to, uh, uh, and if the, if 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 uh, a government service is not able to uh, uh, to 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 use that standard, uh, there needs to be an explanation why that is not possible. Uh, so that I think is a good incentive for uh, all kinds of government services to, 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 to um, uh, use the uh, security standards. Um, sometimes there are practical differences, difficulties. Uh, it's not always possible to uh, use this, uh, but uh, I think that uh, to overcome this kind of difficulties, we need to look into those kind of difficulties to get there somehow. Um, um, maybe you need some uh, additional uh, support to get there and, and maybe also in the end uh, a prescription. So political discussion about, you know, going a step further and saying, okay, uh, if 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 the, the, the launching customer uh, argument doesn't work, uh, then maybe we can go think about going a step further and uh, making it uh, obligatory. But I think that we are not there yet, and hopefully, will it will not be necessary to 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 go there. Um, all we need, I think, is one big cyber attack, and then all of us people will start. Yes. Going, Whoa, well, why didn't we do this? I, I, I must say, we have been advocating for security standards for IoT uh, in, in the in the uh, European Union, uh, and uh, especially uh, there is a, a, a regulation which makes it possible that security in IoT products is possible to regulate it. Um, it's not maybe the preferred option, but we have uh, advocated that that should be done. And we are, let's say, hoping that uh, in a short while, uh, the European uh, Union, European Commission will come forward with regulation that minimum security standards will be applied for IoT uh, products. So I think that, so I agree with Wolof that the preferred option is launching customer 
trying to convince market parties to go there. But if, if, if that's not possible, there should be other ways to promote it or even regulate it. Thank you. Thank you. I see uh, Auke has a, and then uh, a comment. I think it's becoming a very uh, uh, Western European party here. So I hope that some people from the other regions uh, will also uh, join uh, to the discussion. Auke. Yeah, my name is Auke Pals and uh, I'm trying to give my opinion as a, cu a customer. Uh, because as a customer, I want to buy certain products in the store. Uh, let's take, for example, um, my lights that I've connected to the internet. Um, and I might hope that, that uh, those lights are secure and they, these are safe and that nobody can spy on me uh, having my lights on or, or off. Did you buy them at the action for five euros? Because I can guarantee you that they're not safe. Uh, luckily, not at the action for five euros. Um, but I hope this bigger company, which is also a medical uh, equipment, does um, <laughs> does make those lights safe. Um, but as a customer, I yeah, I don't really have um, a position in that. By my you, side, do you, but... you, need, you need to, you know, join the Dutch consumer organization uh, that does look at these kind of things and tells you exactly. But the, this is exactly the problem: is that there is no guarantee because it's not a requirement that that these products are going to be be safe, and they could be spying on you in your own house. Yeah, and in that respect, uh, I hope that my government uh, is protecting myself from um, buying. Yeah lights that are for instance not safe but it doesn't because you order them by ali from alibaba and they just send them straight to your house mm. and where does the dutch government come in in the transaction between you and uh, an international company and i hope that at the border of europe in this case um some regulation is protecting me as a customer from um from buying those goods uh, but <laughs> i am also aware that it's pretty difficult to put that into place. Yeah, I'm, I'm just glancing at the Ministry of Economic Affairs. Are you ready to get the Dutch customs to open every single package coming <laughs> from outside of the European Union and check to make sure that our consumer rights are protected? I think it would be virtually impossible, but I think you make a very good point. But for that, we would then need regulation. We'd need, need standards so that, that they would know what to actually look for. Yeah, because your first question was politics or consumer organizations. And I guess um, it has to be a collaboration of those two, but indeed consumer organizations may be setting the scene, um, putting it on the agenda by politics, by uh, giving a good example uh, of something which went wrong or by foreseeing, uh, foreseeing problems. Uh, and if the agenda setting has been done, then I do, um, do guess it's up to politics to protect me as a customer um from buying goods that are uh, not secure thank you so i'm going to take a, a couple more comments but then Rulof, i'm going to hand it over to you because we're putting different sessions together so uh then yes yeah, just so you know um this is why i'm giving you a little heads up here for the other part um is there somebody especially from another region who would like to contribute to the discussion yes please And please introduce yourself, of course, for the uh, audience. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, maybe I should remove the mask. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Savu. I'm from Brazil, from the technical community. Uh, uh, and about the, this point of regulating the, the, the devices and something like that, like that uh, how could I say that? The point is that it goes a, a, a bit beyond uh, having new uh, standards and, and so on, because in other types of, of devices and in, in other uh, scenarios, we, have, we also have uh, rude uh, security uh, problems. As for example, I can cite here uh, the problem in, uh, during the WannaCry uh, malware, uh, that lots of hospitals uh, stopped to work just because uh, their devices 
uh, used Windows XP, and <laughs> it, it was supposed to not be connected to the internet, and 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 somehow the, the 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 malware got to the to those devices and there were some some problems on that uh so the point is that uh, coming from the technical community i can say that people only do things when it hurts when the internet go when when the internet go sorry internet goes goes down when uh, my device is not working, my light switch is not working. People only do do things uh, about security when it hurts. Uh, other examples: IPv6, uh, RPKIA, KI, KI, okay, <laughs> uh, and so on. So for me, it's still a challenge to understand how to. Uh, uh, force is not the best word, but okay. Uh, is make the the technical community understand well the problem, deal and deal with the problem of deploying the security uh, standards and best practice, uh, and not only by regulating, but maybe uh, don't know creating policies that that. Uh, you get some bonus, one some gift for doing good things or something like that. Uh, maybe this kind of approach may work better. Uh, I'm not sure, but I, I think that from the, the the technical point of view, from the people who are working with tech, uh, and and more and more beyond than IoT, the point is that people don't do nothing if it's not paying. If it's working. We keep doing. <laughs> so if there's no security incident all year, everybody gets a t-shirt or a little bit more substantial than that? Yes, please. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Naima Lugangira. I'm a member of parliament in Tanzania. And I was, first of all, I apologize for being a little bit late. I was a bit lost. Um, but I was very interested in this session and I particularly wanted to understand, you know, most of these companies, um, the regulations and the, you know, different mechanisms to protect the consumers in developed world, you know, it's very much structured. But the same companies when they come to do business in Africa or in other developing countries, they don't tend to follow the same criteria that they fall in the developed countries. So I was a bit curious to understand is how can um, developed countries ensure that these uh, multinationals, tech companies, et cetera, maintain the same level of protecting consumers despite where they're operating? Because we found that, let's say if they come, you know, they look at developing countries like Tanzania and others as sort of a dumping place. So because we are not yet in terms of our policy and regulatory framework, we're not yet where perhaps the developed countries are. We're still developing our you know, digital um, different laws, and we're still yet even understanding on how to regulate the, the digital sector and technology, et cetera. So there's a huge loophole, which unfortunately tends to be taken um, to their advantage and to our, detri our detrimental. So I just wanted to understand what can be done to have that holistic you know, protection for the customers. Thank you. Can I first say how wonderful it is to have a politician at the IGF? Because uh, we have had yeah. such difficulty always trying to get uh, politicians to come here because it's such a crucial uh, um, you know, part of trying to find the solutions to the problems that are happening uh, online. So uh, a big welcome to you. Thank and you. Uh, and secondly, what an excellent question, because I think this is a challenge everywhere. Um, the Corporate Europe Observatory has done an investigation into the lobby of big tech in Brussels. And I can tell you that even there, which is supposed to be highly regulated, it's very developed and sophisticated, the amount of money and access that big tech companies have in order to try to lobby for their own financial benefit, ex the exclusion of, uh, of, of um, uh, end users and others, it is extraordinarily challenging to try to, to counter that. 
And so my day job is actually I'm director of Transparency International Netherlands, and we try to to look at how uh, corporate lobbying uh, influences and the access they have to ministers and 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 to do things. So it is it is extremely difficult. Um, so are there people who have suggestions here uh, to answers? Um, I believe having strong consumer organizations, having very alert politicians like you, having media on top of this, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's part of, a, you know, the whole system of democracy and the rule of law. Does anybody want to come in either on this point? Otherwise, I'm going to hand it over to Rulof because uh, we're supposed to be combining different sessions here. It's an excellent question. We're going to take it over coffee as well, I think. Uh, and continue a bit more because I, I think just having a politically aware uh, um, uh, digitally aware politicians like you uh, asking this precise question is the most important step because that way you get to um, uh, you know question the government well why are you dealing with this company why did you sign this contract uh, can do what we can do As, de as developed countries. Yes. Yeah. I think here there's a, there's a, I would like to make a distinction uh, without wanting to get too political between American companies, many of them are American, which is highly unregulated, uh, where they still believe in, you know, the power of the shareholder capitalism, uh, you know, and all that, even though the Biden administration is trying to change things a bit. And Europe, where at least we have started with regulating, for example, with the GDPR to, to make sure that people have privacy rights and that uh, data can't be marketed in the way that, that the Americans did. So I would split the developed countries into different, uh, different groups uh, in, the, in this regard. And I, I'm, I don't think Europe has a, the equivalent of a Facebook or a Google. <laughs> or anything like that. But, um, uh, but if there are examples of companies, then of course we could uh, probably talk to them, uh, put pressure on them, shame them, and uh, expose them. Yeah. What do you think, Olaf? I'm gonna hand over to you. So maybe well check with you first because you gave me four questions for this group um and i was supposed to talk with the working group on the gap uh, the knowledge and, and, and education gap um, but we've been talking about um, how to implement standards and one of the reserved questions of what kind of standards should we talk about so do you have a preference on which the last one okay so the question for the group and that's the whole of this group again right is um, can we come up with a, a, a top 10 or a top 20 of the standards that we think, security standards that we think should be on the list uh, to get implemented everywhere globally, let's say. Is there anybody who wants to make a proposal? We've heard a few of them already. Nobody. So what are you guys doing here? <laughs> You want me to repeat the question? Okay, what we we are well, we are challenged to come up with a list of let's say twenty or well at least ten security standards that should be implemented globally everywhere. So they should be on this government list that they use. I think um, uh, somebody mentioned it. Oh yeah, I think Wout talked about it, what we call the apply or explain list eh, in the Netherlands. Um, where the standards organization has a list, the government uses it. So every time it contracts an ICT supplier, this list, they have to either apply the standards or they have to explain why they can't. So we could, we could start from that list. I know that IPv6 is on it, DNSSEC is on it, um, DMARC is on it recently. I don't know if the OWASP, but that's not really a standard, but that's more of a best practice. They're probably on it as well if they build a website, I'm sure. What are other ones? I think if everybody was here to get educated, not to provide answers. <laughs> ah. There's there's somebody who wants to respond. Oh, 
Oh, you talked about uh, the border, no, not the border gateway protocol, but the best common per BCP eight. What is it? 32, 30, the one that prevents spoofing. Sir, there you go. Okay. Savio <laughs> uh, for the records again. Uh, I would like to suggest maybe to put in, in that session list uh, the manufacturer user description for the uh, IoT context. It's the uh, it was uh, from the the, the IETF, the RFC eighty five twenty, uh, and the, it it goes in, in one in one a uh, way that uh, reduces the possibility of one device one IoT device being attacked. Uh, it closes the, the possibly open gate and reduces the poss possibility of, for example, you being infected by the Myra, Mirai, botnet, but Mirai botnet and so on. So I think th that this one, at least for IoT devices, is, is good. I don't like that, that face. <laughs> RFC 8520. And that's an RFC describing a list of standards that IoT devices should adhere to. Is it a bit like the, I think it's, how long that is ago? That's already, I think about five years ago or something, US Senate adopted a list of, I think, eight okay. criteria uh, that should apply to any IoT device being manufactured or imported in the United States. I don't know how we are doing on that because I remember that Europe is going to follow that, but I think we're still talking about it instead of, is that something that you are, a list of standards for IoT devices, right? And is uh, that described in that RFC? No, no, there is not a list. I, I'm, I mean, we are discussing and discussing about uh, a list of standards that should be good to be implemented. So I'm mentioning only this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Vim, but yeah, you have to go up to the microphone again. And I saw, I was wondering who this Yulov is, but that's me probably. That that should be R O E L O F. First, I thought it was Olaf, but yeah. it's, yeah. I think J just to just to pose a question, I think for discussion when we are talking about a list. Um, recently, the uh, ITF developed a standard called for D O H. DNS over HTTPS, uh, which is a, at, at the moment very controversial, or at least in discussion. Uh, I wondered if we can have a discussion on uh, should it be promoted or shouldn't it? Because uh, I think also some political questions are involved with this one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think most people that, that have some knowledge about DOH or there's, the, there's DOT also, uh, D, uh, DNS over TLS. Um, I think the protocols themselves are pretty good, but they they kind of open the gates for the big tech, tech companies to dominate um, DNS resolving uh, with their business. And I think there's some examples where the default settings of your browser already point to DOH servers, which is good, Unless it's a American-based big tech, we do your DNS by default uh, solution. Um, so there's there's more of a, a political and market side, and especially political in the sense of, um, let's say, strategic uh, digital uh, autonomy. But the, the technology itself right, was developed by the ITF, I think, is a sound protocol. That's not the discussion. It's the, it's more the macroeconomic and political impact of that kind of a solution. But I think, well, if, if we solve the, the resulting problem, then I think encrypted DNS is a, is a good standard to adhere to. Yeah. Although I think some um, government parties might consider that to be a threat to their ability to hunt down criminals. Um, well, not not just like that. I think we have to we have to um, address the issue that it it makes it possible for a few big tech companies to dominate the DNS resolver uh, business, and um, and 
well, I think you have heard about what is it called DNS for EU. So the, the European Union is looking at an, a solution to that, but we have to have that kind of a solution because most users will not change the, the default DNS settings in their browser. They they will have they won't have a clue and they shouldn't have either. So I think we have to come up with a solution for that before we put this on the standards list. But it would be a good standard, in my opinion. Other people who want to provide some input. We, we, now, we, we haven't talked really about, I think, one, one of the problems the lady in here in front of the room was addressing, manufacturers' standards. And, and does anybody know how, how we are doing in Europe on standards for IoT devices? Because I know that we wanted to follow what, what the US did a couple of years ago, but I don't know, have we adapt, adopted any of those? We will try to keep them off the market, but which will still be difficult if Auka directly orders orders in China. Yeah. But there's probably an educational gap. We have to tell them that that's a dumb idea. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So there's some 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 progress in there, and that those are also standards like a strong password, uh, regular updates, um, security settings. That kind of stuff. Okay. Alka, can you? But again, in this, um, as a consumer, you don't know what the standards are, which are provided by the manufacturer. So that results into almost the same comment, but in a different package. Um, government should protect the customer from uh, implementing those standards. Uh, because as a consumer, I don't see that from the outside on the box of the website. If it's from Alibaba or Philips, um, yeah, I can think uh, lo logically in that so and make a distinction, possibly also between price or other standards, or if there is a certain logo on it. Um, could be China export or CE. It's uh, no, but it's different. It's difficult for a consumer again. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but this doesn't really scale very well. I think that, that is the problem because it, it would be possible to make sure that you cannot use your internet connection to order anything in China, but you would probably consider that kind of filtering or blocking that is, yeah, which you don't want. Um, then the government could decide that they get people and they open everything that is sent to your home before it gets to your home. You wouldn't like that either. Eh? So the, there's some responsibility in, with the consumer as well. We cannot put everything at the government level. Wim, yeah, from, uh, from the government's perspective. I think that um, there is the... Uh, we introduced it uh, a couple of years ago in, in Europe, the Cybersecurity Act. The Cybersecurity Act uh, uh, makes sure that uh, there are um, certification schemes. Uh, and certification schemes, of course, use uh, standards. But um, uh, it takes time to develop these certification schemes, which say you can see what kind of level of security is attached to a certain product or even service uh, uh, which you apply. So we started uh, to discuss first the very high level of security of products like microchips, for instance, they should be very secure because they are used in very uh, 
let's say, uh, high sensitive areas like banking or cars or mobility or whatever. Now we are also, and we are trying to, 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 to get there. Now we are also uh, uh, talking about securing the cloud certification schemes for cloud. Uh, and uh, then of course you come to the discussion where uh, uh, next? Uh, and uh, there is the discussion uh, when we talk about, for instance, IoT, should you use the radio equipment directive to uh, uh, make sure that they are uh, um, that there are minimum standards, or should you use the Cybersecurity Act for IoT products? Well, our preferred route is the minimum standards for the radio in the radio equipment directive. That we could, at a certain point in time, also develop certification schemes for IoT, which then, of course would make the consumer much more aware of uh, how, what kind of level of security is connected to a certain product, whatever you have, a, a, a light bulb or uh, whatever you, you, you want to apply in your home environment. So I think it's a, it's a complicated uh, question and uh, with, uh, <laughs> different levels of action. Um, Thanks, Vlad. Uh, yeah, yeah th that's the idea to have high, uh, medium of average and low. I think our time is up. Eh? Uh, see what's standing here. So. You want the mic? Thank you, Olaf. Thank you. Uh, Rudolf, your phone, I think. Yes. Okay. Is the, the other group is back as well. Welcome back. Uh, we've had a discussion here. You had a discussion there. Um, well, yes, we, 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 we actually were in mid-flow when we, uh, we <laughs> shut down. So I just want to apologize to my uh, colleagues in the breakout, uh, online breakout, for not, not wrapping up smoothly. But we covered uh, quite a lot of ground. That's very good. So you've been very active. So I'll invite you to uh, to report first because we haven't seen you on the screen for a while. So uh, uh, who is reporting on your side? Um, Rose, uh, if Rose is back with us, I'll are leave you the able... reporting to you. No, I'll leave the reporting to you, Mark. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I think we're reporting now to the whole meeting for the whole session. Are you able to quickly sum up what we covered in terms of um, you know, complexity and uh, uh, finding ways around um, uh, not, not perhaps seeking total harmonization, but um, ways of um, uh, ensuring awareness of, of standards amongst a small, you know, any, any business enterprise, for example, and users generally, um, and uh, the, uh, we talked about engine, engineers and their training, how they perhaps their, their co curricula for their training uh, should uh, be a, uh, in, encompass issues like societal uh, context, uh, consumer protection, human rights, and so on. And then uh, we talked about um, uh, uh, issues of trust, and uh, and then uh, very quickly we're almost lurched into the area of you know pros and cons of regulation do you want to do you want to recount a bit more about that rose from your more comprehensive notes than mine oh i think you've got the uh, the, the most important uh, uh, points there um somebody said um uh, like you said that it's it's for uh, medium small enterprises very hard uh, to um uh, to have the capacity to implement standards properly. Uh, it's, a, it's a capacity problem more than an, a knowledge problem. They, they, they feel um, 
the importance uh, to implement standards well, but uh, it's for, for medium and small enterprises uh, hard because they have a lot of other stuff to do as well. Um, and we discussed um, um, indeed um, the importance of, of um, uh, standards and, and uh, human rights and privacy and everything, all the aspects who are uh, related to standardization uh, should be um, in the curriculum for, for engineers because they're the technical guys who should organize the standards uh, uh, properly, security properly, and they should also learn about uh, privacy and human rights uh, to understand the importance uh, to, to uh, develop it properly. So that would be my uh, summarization. Thank you very much, uh, Royce. Um, okay, Vart, really, it's back to you uh, with just one additional comment. Um, we didn't get down to sort of specifics of key standards, you know, your top 20 uh, um, uh, request. We didn't get to that. We, we wanted to focus really on uh, what, what were the critical problems. And I think that's what we've, we've, we've covered um, in, a, in a sort of condensed conversation. We could have gone off on all kinds of different uh, angles, of course, but uh, we were conscious of, uh, of the time. Uh, so back to you, Vat. I hope that's, uh, that's a helpful input for the session. And my thanks to all the colleagues in the, in the breakout uh, who, uh, who spoke so uh, with, with such focus and uh, uh, with some real free thinking. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I can't see you all on the screen, but uh, thank you, Rose, for taking notes and uh, for uh, actively all participating in this discussion because you've more or less covered everything that we did not discuss here. So it's some sort of a harmonious division uh, somehow. Um, I'm looking to the room here. Uh, who is going to do the reporting is Auke. So I'm asking to step to the microphone and then we'll hear what we've been discussing here in, uh, in Katowice. Thank you, for, thank you very much, Wout. Um, yeah, I took notes and I'm grabbing my laptop because we had quite an extensive discussion here. And the first part of the discussion was what uh, are the actual needs of security? Is that uh, to be po uh, by politics or more to be decided by consumer organizations? Um, and the first um, speaker from the audience was that uh, it should be the government that could act as a consumer um, before regulating. It's bad, and it's better than showing example. Um, after that, we, we yeah we had a good balance here. We had also government in the room, um, and yeah, we the government mentioned that uh, the security standards it might be possible to regulate, but advocating is also being successful. And then uh, I took a different role as a consumer um, where I said, yeah, as a consumer, you don't really see um, what standards are applied in the products that you buy, for instance, in a store. Um, so, yeah, and we also had a really good uh, question from a parliamentarian of Tanzania. And she asked a question, what can developed countries do to uh, protect the customers in developing countries? And as an audience or in the room, yeah, we really had, we were struggling answering that question. But that was also, uh, I guess, personally, I also liked that, or not that we liked struggling, but that it was difficult to come up with an answer because that's also the importance of the question. And I hope that in further sessions, we can answer that question. Um, oh, I'm now speaking for myself instead of reading my comments, but- um, <laughs> That's what we're here for. Exactly. Uh, and we also had the second part um, where we uh, try to come up with a list of 10 uh, security standards. Um, but I touched upon the point that the room was not really prepared on giving 10, uh, 10 items, but we did have a good uh, conversation on um, some security standards for uh, Internet of Things devices. Um, 
And yeah, we later on developed the question from, yeah, what um, should again be the role of a government? Should they protect customers or should they um, try to advocate again for these standards? These were uh, my notes, uh, but I'll send them to you and I hope you can. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Auke. And uh, I just remembered that I started this session because there were so many issues on the getting onto Zoom and everything that I even forgot to introduce myself. So, but my name is Walter Natris, and I'm the coordinator of this IGF Dynamic Coalition on Internet Standard Security and Safety. And Mark Carvel, who's online, is a senior policy uh, advisor of the Dynamic Coalition. Um, we're around for about a year and we're developing our program for 2022. And the idea is that all three working groups and the dynamic coalition as a whole comes up with very tangible outcomes in the view of the new IGF, the IGF plus. So that there are policy recommendations, some guidelines, advices, but perhaps also capacity building programs that could help questions like we've just heard from the lady from Tanzania. So the sort of outcomes that have, can be very practical and usable instantly by all stakeholder communities. To be able to do that, we have to fill in this program and all three working group chairs will be presenting on Thursday on their ideas for the next year, for 2022, and what the end results should be when we're together in Addis Ababa in 2022. Having said that, there's still some room for discussion or questions. So I'm looking into the room if there are any questions or additional comments that you've heard from the other group or something that you would like to bring forward in general. Yeah. Is the, on Zoom, please raise your hand because then uh, Mark is the, the, the external moderator. You can see if there are any questions. I'm looking around the room here. So anybody would like to, to comment on what you heard and also from what you heard from the other group? There are no hands here on your, your end, Mark. Um, I'm just, thank you, Bart. I'm just going through the, uh, the chat and um, the various um, points coming through. Um, so let me just pick out um, uh, one, a couple of them. Um, Serge, uh, Serge Ross, uh, who I think is, is, yeah, he's with us yeah, here. Thank you, Serge. Yes, you're here, of course. Um, there are different communities, I'll read it. Uh, there are different communities, and I think the more open ones create better standards. I'm not sure regulation is the solution empowerment and i that was a um we didn't use the word empowerment but i think that's a very good uh, way of capturing points that came up in our breakout session that um if if um stakeholders have greater um knowledge uh about uh, the, the critical importance of standards that will you know lead to greater security and safety online um uh so that was uh serge's uh, point in the chat uh, yuri kargopolov um uh should we consider training programs as one of the types of standards to achieve our goals um uh, i mean in the coalition we have a working group on uh, education and skills and uh we talked in our breakout session as i mentioned uh and, and rose uh uh, reported um, training of engineers uh, is uh, one aspect of that vocational training, if you like, um, about standards and about uh, you know, their uh, importance uh, for for social welfare, for 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 business, uh, for personal consumers, and so on. Um, so I, th those are, those are the, I hope I haven't missed any other critical points uh, from the from the chat. Bart, back to you. Yes, I've got a question here, and please introduce yourself. 
Good morning. Um, my name is Elisa Hiva. I work at the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy. Um, if we need empowerment, um, how much... Um, I, I know IPv6 is not always deemed as a security standard, but how much empowerment do we need for the world to turn to IPv6? I mean, it's been a, a standard here for many, many, many years. I think it's uh, dates back to 1992, my birth year, um, and we're still not using it fully. So how much empowerment do you need for a standard to become the standard um, if it's deemed a very useful standard? Thanks. That, that is a good question. Um, looking at, at, at Serge, because you, you put this forward, would you like to comment on the, on the, on the question? Yes. So... I think this is a really good question. And the reason that I think, or one of the reasons that IPv6 never really flew was, honestly, there was really no reason. I mean, the internet continued working without really big problems. I mean, we had kind of workarounds that were cheaper. And what I really mean by empowerment is, is that we start helping people to actually create secure products. and. And rather than for, and and making it clear why this is a benefit, it's a for IPv6 we failed to convince people why this is a, a a benefit. Because when I talk to engineers in big companies, they always say, "Well, then I have twice as much work to do. Uh, I have to maintain IPv4 and IPv6. And there's nothing I gain. So why would I do this?" And if we if we look at security, I think. It's not that people produce insecure products because they don't care. It's just because they don't really know why they would do this and they, they don't understand the implications. There was one question now of breakout saying, how can civil society participate in these type of things? Civil society probably can't because it's all really super technical things. But what we need to do here is empower engineers to actually understand implications of whatever they do on civil society and pretty much all stakeholders. That's what I mean with empowerment. You have to give people an incentive to actually do this. And with IPv6, we just didn't have that. Can, can I ask a question, Serge, uh, Serge, to this? Because uh, I my experience is that engineers understand perfectly well how this works and what that they would like to make it secure. But at the end of the day, it's their bosses who just want the product to be cheap because it's all about profits. Uh, and so I'm wondering uh, whether it's the engineers we need to empower or whether it's the consumers who demand certain kind of standards, because I, I can't see uh, tech companies or uh, producers of what is very often really, really nasty, cheap plastic shit uh, without any security components, which allows weak passwords, which you can hook up to the internet, which is not upgradable, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's just going to keep happening unless something happens somewhere. And I, I uh, you know, the older and wiser I get, the less I believe in empowerment of either engineers or consumers or anything else. But wondering whether we actually need to put our fist down uh, and and make sure this uh, this happens in some other way. So I, I don't understand how those engineers are going to convince their bosses to do something which is probably going to be more expensive, and then convince consumers to to pay for it as well unless it's a, it's an actual enforced standard, if I may, may call it like that. And, and I look to GDPR as an example. Nobody was going to take privacy seriously until the European Union uh, regulated it and said, you're going to get fined. And, and that's what it took. And now it's basically a global standard if you want to do business with Europe. Yeah. I think this is a, we probably would need not a two hour session to start getting into this. But my, my view really is, is that when you start about talking about standards, it's really, if the standards kind of, it's the standards that need to empower you. It should be cheaper to produce something secure than, than something insecure. Why are we producing insecure stuff? It's because we companies tend to reinvent the wheel over and over again. It's like when IoT came up, we made all the same mistakes we did with web, web applications 15 years ago. So what we need is, is kind of open, frameworks, open tools that kind of have this built in. So you, as an engineer or as a company, you don't have to start at the bottom. In our breakout session, we discussed this a little bit at, at the beginning. It, it's 
It's about, well, if we start insisting on, on the expertise, we, we hamper innovation. But innovation is not about reinventing the wheel. Innovation is about taking good components and do something new with them. It's a, like a good cook doesn't need to go out and reinvent farming because he just needs farmers to produce good produce so he can cook a good meal. And I think that's what's a bit lacking. We still have so much stuff that's closed. It's not accessible. It's not available. And I think you're going into a, into a world where, where people can start innovating on, on existing and secure frameworks. Then that's when we start moving forward. But I, I totally agree. There's, there's a lot of, of ifs and, and whens in this. And we probably need to work a little more before this flies. But I think regulation is regulation is not going to fly, and I don't think the the comparison to to GDPR is a good one. In the, and I think GDPR is is a success. So don't get me wrong here. Okay. But uh, Yuri, says, I, I, I saw it, Mark. There, yeah, just okay. one comment, and I'll give the word to, to Yuri, okay. and then we start have to wrap up. Looking at the clock in front of me. Um, I, one, Sarah, I think that the, the comments you make make a lot of sense. Um, the, and that, yes, we do need to have a lot more discussions on, on this topic. And uh, perhaps as a dynamic coalition, we should start organizing them and making sure that, that, that the right people come into a room because it's, it's about empowerment. And what Luzubis was saying is true as well, because well, as I look at it from the outside, and don't get me wrong, because I have a lot of respect for, for the whole technical community, as you probably know, but we've been talking to the same people for 20 years on these sort of standards, and not a lot changes. Something changes, but not a lot changes. It means that other people have to be brought in to this discussion. And that's what we try to do in this dynamic coalition, to make sure that other people start talking to each other than the, re the, the, the regular crowd, the, the usual suspects as they call it in English. So, so that is one of the aims that we, we are yeah, at this moment sort of struggling to do, but we are moving and we are progressing. So um, having said that, Sarah, perhaps through, through first we can do something together as well and, and start organizing some sessions together in the, in, in, in the coming year. So that's an invitation, and let's discuss that after uh, after this session, of course. Yuri, your hand is up, and I'll give you uh, the final word, and then uh, we'll start wrapping up this session. And as you are leaving, uh, sorry, I would very much like to make your acquaintance because we, we do need to talk on this topic uh, you've introduced. So thank you for your question. Um, Yuri, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, very briefly. Uh, the big challenge of security is uh, uh, what we are now reacting to what it was already and not to what will be happen. Uh, the Peter Bacher spoke about it uh, uh, on our uh, IGF, uh, I mean IGF UA. And uh, it's not depend uh, from uh, what type of uh, protocols you uh, will be used in your uh, IoT system. It's not depend from I, uh, IPv6. It's not depend from uh, LoRaWAN. It's not depend from Sigfox, et cetera. It depends from the complex of um, our, uh, complex of our challenges and uh, from uh, trust uh, environment and from a uh, conversion environment, from the uh, technical uh, aspects. Uh, we discussed these uh, issues uh, on our panel, sub-panel. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, Yuri. Uh, Mark, have you had final comments in the chat? Because I can't see them. Uh, no, I think just a sense that uh, we've, we're on a very uh, important conversation. Uh, Serge made that point. And um, I mean, my, I, I feel, you know, we've got the IG off to a great start, actually, <laughs> with this, despite the technical uh, glitches. I think uh, we, we have to pick up this up and take it forward. Um, I mentioned we have, uh, well, we've got our main coalition session on Thursday, as you mentioned, and also our networking session. 
on uh, on Friday, and I think we should highlight this as a as a topic that will engage a lot of people. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody, as well, from me. I'm not Yuri, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, too. <laughs> uh, Yuri, too, I mean, Mark. Talk to you about yeah, and, and thank you, Mark, and, 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 and thank you all for participating online. As, as some final comments, I think we, we have heard, <clears throat> sorry, we have heard some, some very good comments on, on the way forward, because that was actually the, the intention of this session, not just to make our work known, but also to, to hear what your thoughts are on how we should progress. And this is not an easy topic, because the, the, the way that I've come to look at it in the, in the past year is that if you work in the domain name sex, uh, sector, like, for example, Rulof, you focus on DNSSEC. And that's what you discuss with each other and how to progress, progress DNSSEC and, and, and other domain name security systems. If you're in the internet resource world, you talk about secure routing, and that's what you promote. If you're in software, you just talk about software. And if we build websites, you, build, you talk about secure websites. But when you're the consumer, like Alka was saying, or when you're a procurer within a corporation or an organization like a government, it's not just DNSSEC you have to worry about. You have perhaps a million standards that you're facing, that you're buying something and you don't even know where to start. So what most likely is the outcome for somebody who procures, either you're told what to buy by your bosses, or you don't procure security at all because you don't know where to start the conversation. And on the, perhaps sometimes even on the other side, who you're buying from is not even knowledgeable enough. And that's the sort of empowerment that I think that, that Sarah was also talking about, but how do we make sure that we come to knowledgeable decisions when you're procuring ICT services, IoT devices, or any other stuff that connects to the internet? And that's why I came up with it, not just me, but the Dynamic Coalition came up with the idea, perhaps we should start with the top 20. Because we, if we can identify together the most important standards, we have a start of a debate and not an overwhelming one. And from there, you, people start understanding the topic and you can start developing. If we, a year from now, could develop some sort of an overview, what sort of standards are there? What exactly are they for? What do they cure? It would mean that somebody could have something to look at. And perhaps it exists, but nobody's told me that it is. It's just this view of many organizations making some sort of standards or best practices out in the world. So should we connect them somehow and make sure that they become accessible in language that non-technical people can understand as well? So that is the sort of goals that we're looking at the individual working groups that I introduced, IoT security, education and skills and procurement are working on their own programs and they will be presented on, on Thursday at 10 to five in room four from the top of my head. So I hope that we can welcome you there as well. And I'm wrapping up in the very, very last session, seconds with thanking the moderators and the reporters for doing their part of the job became a bit chaotic at the beginning because of failure at the website. I think we've done very well looking at what happened in the room and, and what happened remotely. I think the, the rapporteurs, please send Mark and me the notes because we uh, via the email because we have to produce a report two hours from now uh, officially. So that means some work. Uh, thank you, kind people back there for organizing, organizing everything for us uh, in the background and making sure that we get breakout sessions, et cetera. And with that, uh, I also want to thank finally my colleagues in the Dynamic Coalition for making these sessions possible as well and, and thinking of the concept and everything. And finally, our, our sponsors that have helped us get here to up to today. And with that, I wrap up and I hope to see you on Thursday and thank you again for your contributions because they're very valuable. Have a good, very good IGF and see you hopefully soon.